Wednesday night. And we are continuing our study uh, dealing with the practices of the early church. And as we looked in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And we're looking into the subject of uh, fellowship or what we have in common. And we were looking at some of these things as far as fellowship is concerned. And we looked in that passage in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, concerning um, some of the some of the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy. And then last week we were looking at Ephesians chapter four. And if you have your Bible there, I just like to pick up kind of where we left off. Excuse me here just a minute. And we looked last week at uh, Ephesians four four. It says there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Uh, we pointed out that the one body is a reference to the body of Christ, which is the church that began on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and we can prove that from going to Acts chapter 10, as well as chapter 11, when um, Peter talks about you know the same thing that happened to the people in Cornelius' house, and they spoke in tongues, the same thing happened on the day of Pentecost. So that's how we can tie it back to uh, Acts chapter 2 as far as the beginning of the church was concerned. Now, uh, then we also pointed out that there is one spirit referring to the Holy Spirit, who is the one who baptizes people into Christ at the moment of their salvation today. Uh, the day of Pentecost, it happened for them initially at that time. But tonight we want to look at this third thing that are called seven unities that need to be kept. And it has to do, it says, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. And so I want us to think a little bit tonight about the hope that the believer has. And as I was uh, looking over some different things, as far as illustrations were concerned, I came across an interesting story of a man who approached the Little League baseball game one afternoon and he asked the boy in the dugout what the score was. And the little boy responded by saying, 18 to nothing, we're behind. Well, the man said, well, I suppose you're kind of discouraged, aren't you? He says, why should I be discouraged? He said, we haven't even gotten up to bat yet. <laughs> there was a little boy with a lot of hope. Well, he, that's not the kind of hope that we're talking about tonight. We want to and the believer's hope is the confident expectation that we have that is based on a promise from the Word of God. And even as we sang just a little bit earlier, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Everything, that's the foundation upon which our lives must be built. Uh, we have to be on the rock. There are a lot of people who are building their houses on the sand. And as Matthew 7, uh, the last few verses there in Matthew 7, it talks about a lot of people building their houses on sand. And uh, I remember uh, some time ago uh, where we used to we help start a church in Pacifica. They had tremendous waves that were coming in. It was just washing off and all undermining all the, the um, people's houses there. And, you know, going out into the ocean is really kind of tragic. But tonight we want to look at the matter of our hope as believers as one of the things that ought to unite us uh, we are to maintain these things. We don't make these things. We don't, uh, we don't make the body of Christ. The Lord does. He uh, brings the body of Christ into existence. He's the head of the church and we're the members of the body. But as we think about this hope, as I've given you in your uh, notes tonight, the believer's hope, uh, we want to, the information that I have here for you comes from <laughs> W.E. Vine's uh, Bible Dictionary. And he talks about uh, hope as being the favorable expectation or confident expectation that we have as believers. Now, it, he, as I have in your notes, we won't look at it, but in Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 19, there was an evil hope that came upon the children of Israel because of their disobedience to God. So he says, instead of being a good hope for you because of your disobedience to me, he says, you're going to have nothing but troubles, see. And we pointed out to you in, in Isaiah, uh, or rather Deuteronomy chapter 18, the first, uh, Deuteronomy 28, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 14 talks about the blessings that will come to people, the Jews, if they're obedient to the Lord. If they're disobedient, then they can expect the curses. And so because of their disobedience, uh, 
the curses that were going to come upon them. We pointed out to you how that um, in 70 AD when Titus came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the Jews were taken into captivity. There were so many Jews that were taken back into Egypt that there weren't enough buyers uh, for these slaves. And uh, so God didn't want them to go back to, to Egypt, but they ended up there because of their disobedience to the Lord. Well, anyway, uh, as we look at this word hope, uh, we uh, there are some verses here that I've given you. And, and in fact, just let's just look at some of these things. It says in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, let's look at this, these verses, some of these verses, because when you think about the hope that we have as believers, this can really uh, reaffirm us and strengthen us when we recognize, you know, our bodies, for example, my neck tonight is kind of sore, I don't know what, you know, but, uh, or your body, maybe you have aches and pains. Well, he says, Romans eight twenty three. not only that, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within our spirit, uh, within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, which is what? The redemption of our body. You see, our bodies haven't been saved yet. Uh, what part of us is the only part of us that's saved? How many parts do we have? Our soul. We have a soul, and we have what, a, what are the two parts? And spirit and a body, okay? First uh, Thessalonians 5.23, he says, I... Pray for your spirit, soul, and body. So what part of you is the only part of you that's saved right now? Soul. Spirit. 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 Okay, the spirit that belongs to the mind, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. The soul is the last thing that we say. The soul, we understand to be related to the emotions. So that's why it's very important for us not to be regulated in our decision-making primarily by our emotions. The spirit that belongs to the mind needs to have control, and it needs to be... Uh, in line with the clear teachings of the Word of God whenever possible. Obviously, there are going to be times when uh, you're going to have to make decisions um, without any specific you know, information. For example, when you go to buy a car, buy a home, or whatever, uh, God doesn't specifically spell out to you what you need to do, but there are some basic guidelines that can help you in your decision-making process. Uh, my children sometimes call home and they say, well, Dad, what should I do? And I say, well, you know, I can't really tell you specifically what to do. I can give you some principles, you know, and then uh, ask you to, you know, weigh the evidence. What do you think would be most in line with what God would have you to do? And uh, just recently I wrote to one of my sons and I said, you know, we're asking God to give you wisdom because James 1.5 says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Not only for what to do, but how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, to whom to do it, and all these things are very important. And, you know, Romans, 8, uh, Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we want to try to make good decisions that are based upon the principles that are found in the Word of God. And um, so he says, he, he talks about the redemption of our body. He says in verse 24, for we are saved in this hope, but hope that is uh, seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So, you know, I uh, long for the Lord to come back, but until the Lord comes back, are we just to sit on the mountaintop and wait for him there? No, we're to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And also in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, it talks about those Christians who were idle, that, you know, they were mooching off everybody else instead of being involved in the work that God had given them to do. See? So, uh, you know, we don't set dates for the return of the Lord and the rapture, but we do, we should live in the light of the possibility of the imminent coming of the Lord. And that's a very important thing to do. So that's what you have there in Romans 8, 24 and 25. And then he goes on to say here, this is from uh, W. E. Vine, he says, Hope describes a happy anticipation of good uh, in several pages, uh, places. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it talks about in hope of eternal life, which God, which who cannot lie, promised us promised before time began. So, you know, we have eternal life as a present possession, but the full realization of that won't come until the time of the rapture or when we're caught up to meet when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. See? Now, people who die today, 
uh, they are better off in some ways and that they don't have the pain and suffering that we do. But what are the people in heaven unable to do that we are able to do? Save somebody. Well, okay, we can lead other people to Christ. Yeah. And we can also do what with reference to temptations? We can yield or we can not yield. And if you don't yield, James 1.12 says you will get what? The crown of life. And I don't fully understand that. Uh, it corresponds with what you have in Revelation chapter 2, I think it is verse number 10. It talks about the martyr's crown. Okay, The martyrs were willing to die for their faith because they believed it so fervently that they said, you know, uh, yeah, you could take my life, but, you know, so what? Uh, I was recently listening to a story about a man uh, who wanted to be a missionary. I can't remember his, John something or other. Uh, he wanted to be a missionary, uh, or he did become a missionary with these cannibals in the South Seas or someplace, one of these places. And uh, a man in his church really discouraged him to, from going there, and he said, well, you know, sir, he said, you're getting older, and one of these days you're going to be put in the ground, and you're going to get eaten by worms. And he said, uh, now if I go to this place where they have cannibals and I get eaten up, well, but in the end, we're all going to be glorified together, and it's not going to make any difference, you see. Now, he had a positive attitude that helped him to go to these to this place where, you know, there were cannibals in there. I suppose there are still cannibals someplace on the earth. And the same thing is true with Jim Elliot, the guy, four other men and their wives went down to the Aka Indians, remember? And uh, they all died and perished and they got shot with arrows and their wives, some of their wives went back and, and were able to lead those people to the Lord. So, you know, when the Holy Spirit directs you to go in a certain direction, you know, if it's not contrary to the clear teachings of the Word of God, you should follow that, see. Um, and, um, you know, God needs missionaries in different parts of the world, and uh, so it's important for us to understand that. So, uh, God cannot lie, and then that passage in 1 Peter 1, uh, 21 that he has here, he has his faith and hope in God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, without the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead, we don't really have a hope for the future, do we? But because he rose again from the dead bodily. Now, there are some cults that don't believe in the bodily resurrection. But that's very important for us to believe because that is the basis of our hope for the future. And then he says, secondly, the ground of hope upon which hope is based, Acts chapter 16, uh, verse number 19. It uses that word uh, with reference to the mass slave masters of the demon-possessed girl who... Because Paul cast out the demon from her, she was unable to, you know, keep on foretelling the future, and they lost hope of gaining substance, you know, material um, money from. So that's why they, you know, brought the charges against Paul, and, and Silas had him beaten. So that's what that passage there in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 19 is. And then, of course, it's referred to Christ as our hope of glory. In Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 27. And then thirdly, the object upon which our faith is based, uh, it talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Now, look, let's look at some of the, the passages that are used here uh, that W.E. Vine gives us. In Acts chapter 23, verse 6, let's look at that for just a moment. The Apostle Paul, as he was evangelizing, uh, not only the Gentiles, he was the one that was primarily sent, uh, well, he was sent to the Gentiles, but he didn't neglect the Jews. But we notice in Acts chapter 23 and verse number 6, we find Paul, he appeals to the Pharisees. Now keep in mind that the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees were jumping on Paul. Now what was the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? How, would you, how could you differentiate between these two groups? What did the Pharisees believe in that the Sadducees did not believe in? Okay, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection and in angels. The Sadducees did not. See, The Sadducees, if my memory serves me correctly, they held to the five books of Moses, whereas the Pharisees were the strict legalists. They're the ones that, you know, wanted to make sure everybody was keeping all of the Mosaic Law, all of the Old Testament. And so they're the ones... For example, who added to the requirement of the keeping of the Sabbath, whereas you couldn't even do 
merciful works on the Sabbath. And that's, remember in John chapter 5, that as we were going through, that's what initially got Jesus into trouble because he healed that guy who didn't even ask to be healed. He heals him, the guy at the pool of, of Siloam it is, and the guy gets up and he, you know, and he squeals on Jesus and they said, well, you broke the Sabbath by healing this guy. And Jesus, remember, turns around and says, well, wouldn't you, if you had an animal that fell in a hole, wouldn't you pick it out on the Sabbath? Or, you know, he said, if the boy on the eighth day, you know, on the Sabbath came, would you circumcise him? Well, sure you would say. And so they were inconsistent, but they were threat. their authority was being threatened. And that's one of the reasons why it started out with that. And then as we've been studying on Sunday morning, in chapter 11, when he heals Lazarus, or raises Lazarus from the dead, man, that just about breaks it because... They said, man, if, if he keeps doing this kind of stuff, all the people are going to follow him. We're going to lose our power. The Romans are going to come and take over, and then we'll all be doomed. See? So that's... So what I have written here is Pharisees believe in the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. The Sadducees deny both. Okay, the Sadducees do not, did not believe in angels or the bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. So Paul, these two groups are jumping on Paul. So he says, well, he sees the difference. He says, now the Sadducees were the kind of the, the, the temple priests and so forth. The Pharisees were, they were the guys who wanted to insist on the clarity of the Mosaic law and so forth. But uh, so he, he splits them up. He says, now I'm a Pharisee in, in the fact that he believes in the resurrection. And the, the Sadducees, of course, didn't like that idea, so he's trying to pit them against each other, and he says, for the hope of the resurrection, I am called into question here. And uh, then also notice in Acts chapter 26, uh, we have another illustration here, in Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7, we have Paul before King Agrippa, and he says, now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, to this promise our twelfth tribe, earnestly serving God night and day, hope it to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. He says, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? You see, Paul got into a lot of trouble because he insisted that the resurrection be a part of the message concerning Christ. Now, you're going to hear a lot of guys on radio or TV, they're going to leave out uh, the resurrection. Or they're not going to say, Christ died for your sins. They might say, Christ died for you. Now, it's important to realize, when you're presenting the gospel to somebody, share, Christ died for your sins. And if they believe that, then they're automatically admitting what? They are sinners, right? Some people don't like to think they're sinners. And, of course, uh, when you think about sinning, have you been as bad as you could be? You know, we all could be worse than we have been, but we are as bad off as we can be without Christ as our personal Savior. So not only did Paul insist on, you know, the death of Christ for our sins, he also insisted on the bodily resurrection. And I think this corresponds, uh, slips me right off hand, uh, let me see if I can find it for you real quickly here. I think it's in 2 Timothy, I think it's in 2... Um, yeah, it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change, but the word of God is not changed. Therefore, he says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So insisting upon the bodily resurrection of Christ is an important point to present to people so they have someone in whom they might believe in order to be saved because a dead Christ can't save you. I listened to a fellow today, a very interesting uh, presentation, and he's a good Bible, uh, a good pastor, and a good Bible teacher, but I was a little disappointed at the very end when he talked about, you know, about the matter of salvation. And, um, you know, I, I, I like most of his stuff, but I always try to make sure, and as you can testify, that either in the bulletin or in the message, somewhere along the line, a person, if he or she comes to this church, they're going to hear the gospel. Now, the devil might have earplugs in them so he can't hear, or they might be distracted suddenly by something, but if a person comes regularly to this church, they're going to hear the gospel. And then if they reject Christ as their Savior, I personally think, according to 2 
Thessalonians chapter 2. People who have heard the gospel who have not responded to believe in Christ. See, neglecting Christ is the same as unbelief. So, by unbelieving, by not believing, they're going to be held more accountable than the guy in Timbuktu who's never heard about the Lord. Now, they're both going to be, end up in a bad place, see. But a person who's heard the gospel, I think, in my understanding of the scriptures, will be sent strong delusion during the time of the tribulation so that that person will not believe the gospel and be saved. That's my understanding of Second Thessalonians chapter 2 there. Now, I know there's some fellows that disagree, and that's certainly their right to do so. But here we have it back in Acts chapter 26, where Paul is before uh, King Agrippa, and he says he talks about the hope of the resurrection. Then also notice in Galatians chapter 5, and verse number 5, he talks about the hope of righteousness. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, and verse number 5. Uh, keep in mind when we think about uh, righteousness, uh, how, for example, in John 16, verses 8 through 11, it says, When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, after Christ dies, is buried, rose again, he ascends back to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit down to the earth, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit, he says, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the, the world of sin, righteousness, and, and of judgment of sin because they believe not in me. That's the only sin that will send a person to hell, unbelief. Their degree of suffering in hell will be determined by what they did in this life. See? But that's the only sin. And then of righteousness, he says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now, suppose Christ, at the time of his ascension, went up to heaven and then he ended up back here on earth, never to be able to go back again. What would that tell you? That the, well, they have that same hope that you're hoping for. Well, not only that, but you see, it would tell us that, that the Father did not accept the righteous thing that he did on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins. Are you following me? So, you see, when Christ dies on the cross, and he says, it is finished. Now, we know from 12 o'clock until 3 o'clock, He's separated from fellowship with his father. That's the spiritual death. Okay. Then at 3 o'clock, he die, He gives up his spirit. He, he chooses the time, the moment of his death. See. And that's when he dies physically. So he pays the two penalties, the spiritual death and the physical death. Okay. So after he does it, he goes up into heaven. And since the father accepts him and allows him to stay there, that means that he paid the penalty for our sins. Now let's transfer that over to ourselves. Okay? When you believe in Christ as your Savior, God puts your sin on Christ, right? By the same transaction, he takes Christ's righteousness and he puts it to your account because he says, You died for Christ, you died for your sins in the person of your substitute. Are you following me? That's important to understand it because, you know, I know it's a little, maybe a little deep for the average person, but God says you did the right thing when you believed in Christ as your Savior because you were in essence saying, I died for my sins in the person of my substitute. In Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this is how we become identified with Christ. So, uh, what we have here, it says in uh, Galatians chapter 5, and verse number 5, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, we're going to experience uh, absolute righteousness. See, right now we have positional righteousness. Uh, we're clothed with the garment of Christ. So when the Father looks at us, he has to look at us through Christ. So positionally, we're righteous before God. Practically, we're not always acting right. But in the future, when we see Christ at the rapture, we will be like him, and we will, like his glorified humanity, not his deity. Okay. We will be like him, and from that point on, we will not be able to sin anymore. Making sense? I'm not going to lose you here now. No, that's at the rapture. Right, at the rapture. See. Now, the people that are currently in heaven, they don't have a problem with being tempted by sin. Okay, they, they're not going to be sinning up in heaven. But, and they're not going to be able to lead any more people to the Lord. See? But we who are here on planet Earth, we can still earn the crowns that God says you can earn 
as we walk by the Spirit and allow the God to live his life through our life. Make sense? All right, then let's also go on here. That he talks about the hope of the gospel in Colossians 1.23. He's, well, let's start with verse number uh, 21. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and, not, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, I Paul, am a minister. See? So we have the hope of the gospel here, um, the fulfillment of the promise that God's going to, that he who started the work is going to complete the work. Uh, God, according to Jonah 2.9, God is the one who initiated our salvation. Uh, prior to our being saved, I like to think of a, we belong to the devil's 4-H club. We were helpless, hopeless, hellbound heathen. Uh, and that, the helpless idea comes from Romans chapter 5, verse 6, says, says unbelievers are without strength. They are incapable of saving themselves. No bootstrap religion, okay? We are hopeless. Ephesians 2, 12 says, we who were Gentiles, non-Jews, we had no hope. Uh, the Old Testament, Gentile people, the only hope they ever had was by becoming a proselyte Jew. That's how Rahab, the harlot, you know, she believed and was saved. She became a Old Testament proselyte Jewess. And not only that, but she became an ancestress of Jesus. Uh, same way with Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was a Gentile. Okay, and uh, God saved her as well. All right, so uh, then also notice in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 8, now, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 17 is a classic passage that deals with the rapture of the church. Now, a lot of people believe that Christ is going to come back sometime in the future, but not everybody sees the mystery uh, part of the return of Christ because that was um, uh, something that was unknown in the Old Testament times. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 15 51, and 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a biblical definition of a mystery is what? What is a mystery? Biblical definition of a mystery. Now keep your finger here in First Thessalonians, but go back to Romans chapter 16. And notice in verse number 25. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest, and by the prophetic scripture has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. So here's the biblical definition. Something that was unknown in the Old Testament times has now been revealed and so it is now no longer a mystery, even though it is mysterious to some people still. You know what I mean by that? Some people, the Bible is very mysterious to them. But the mysteries that Paul revealed to maturing believers should be knowable by us. We should know them. See? And one of them pertains to the rapture of the church. And that's what we go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And by the way, the word rapture is not found in the scriptures, but we have in uh, verse number 17. Uh, it says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now this is the word to be seized by force. In the Latin it's rapture, which means to be seized by force. That's where we get the idea from. We meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Now you notice you have a shout. This is similar to what you had in, the, in John chapter 11 when Jesus calls Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Well, this will be designed for New Testament Christians, not the Old Testament believers. By the way, when are the Old Testament believers raised from the dead? Remember? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going fast. <laughs> okay. All right. We, when, when is that? we don't know when the rafter is going to take place, right? 
that's imminent. That's going to happen any time. Okay, but sometime after the tribulation is over, the Old Testament believers be resurrected back to life. But do you know where that's found and how many days after the rapture is over? What's in, I'll just give you the reference. It's in Daniel 12, 12, and it says 1,335 days. Okay, 1,260 days equals three and a half years. You subtract 1,260 from 1,335, and you have 75 days, right? So that's when the Old, <clears throat> that's when the Old Testament believers are going to be resurrected. They will have bodies that are a little different than ours, in that their uh, garments will not be quite as bright as ours. They will shine like the stars of the firmament. Now, when you sometimes in a bright sunny day, uh, you might want to put on sunglasses, even though you're not looking directly in the sun. It's very bright. The, the sky out there is very bright. So it says they will shine like the stars. Well, the stars don't shine quite like the sun does, right? So there are going to be different kinds of garments of light that they have. But that's when the Old Testament believers are going to be uh, they're going to be resurrected. But we notice here in verse. Uh, Number, this is First Thessalonians five eight, but let us put uh, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. And then notice verse number nine: For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's one of the, one of the key verses that tells us that we are not going to go through the tribulation. Now in the previous verses he talks about in verse number two the day of the Lord. It's going to come like a thief in the night. Well, the rapture is not like a thief in the night, but the second, the the tribulation will come like a thief in the night. I'm sorry, where are you? I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5, okay. I still page 1642. Question <laughs> okay, a, a, a question in reference to the what? The secret that Paul talks about. Oh, in, in Romans 16, 25? Yes. Okay, let's go back there a minute. Well, no, my question is only, was he actually the first one? To be told or to know the secret, or just the first one to talk about it. Well, you have well actually the the rapture truth is taught by Jesus in in uh, John fourteen verses one through three. Okay. Uh, but they, the disciples were so messed up emotionally, it didn't register didn't with them. Understand. Yeah, but Jesus said, you know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back. Well, that's talking about the rapture. Not the second coming, but the rapture of the church. But they didn't catch on to that. See? So Paul, after he gets saved, he goes out in the desert with the Lord. He gets all these mysteries revealed to him, and he's responsible to give them to maturing believers. Now, you see, even in the church in Corinth, there were some people of the house of Chloe who were maturing believers. Most of the people in the church in Corinth were carnal. Now, I don't care what people say. You know, there are There is such a thing as carnal Christians. Now, they like to change that word in 1 Corinthians 3 to worldly, but no, Christians can act carnal when they act according to the flesh, which tells you that we still have a sin nature. And 1 John 1 8 says, if you say you don't have a sin nature, you're just deceiving yourself in reference to that truth. You still have one. Aren't they denying the Holy Spirit when they do that? Well, they're denying that part of the truth. Yeah. Uh, you see, a person that would believe that doesn't necessarily mean he's unsaved. See, uh, But... Uh, Sometimes people erroneously teach other Christians, and uh, they do some mental gym gymnastics with people, and they're like the people Peter described in Second Peter chapter three. He says they twist the scriptures, um, but when you interpret them just normally, historically, grammatically, you know, that's what you come up with. And, you know this idea of dispensations. Um, Paul says, "I was the one in Ephesians chapter three. He says, "I was the one who was given this." This, uh, dispens this dispensation of grace to share with you. I'm the steward, and you Christians are part of the household. Okay? So that's how he dispensed it to the household. But up until that time, in fact, the whole church era, if you want to call it that, some, it's really the dispensation of grace, but that whole period from the day of Pentecost down to the rapture was kind of like in a valley between two mountaintops. You see, the Old Testament Jews, they could look at Christ's first coming and his second coming, they didn't see the... the the gap between there, see. But we're living, so to speak, in the valley between the two mountain peaks. But they didn't, Old Testament believers didn't understand that. Now, Christians can and should know that today. That we're not to be confused with the nation of Israel, and we did not replace Israel 
there's that doctrine that's going around called replacement theology, and it's a really uh, unkind thing to, uh, you know, particularly to the Jewish people, to suggest that you know God's done with you as a nation. You say, no, He's not. Romans chapter eleven. It says, has God forsaken Israel? No way. They're temporarily set aside, Romans eleven twenty five, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. But God isn't done with the nation of Israel. And I'm happy that, you know, the current administration seems to be a lot more sympathetic toward the nation of Israel. And even though the Jews are back there, most of them, or a lot of them are back there in Israel since 1948, there's a lot more in New York and Miami and, and L.A. than there are back in Israel. But some are back there, but a lot of them are back there in unbelief. But in the middle of the tribulation, God's going to start dealing with them, you know, as the Antichrist turns on them when they refuse to bow down to his image after he gets killed and brought back to life. But this passage, and then there's also one in reference, a good passage to keep in mind uh, that tells us we're not going to go into the tribulation. That's in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. It says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from what? From the wrath to come. Now this is talking about, uh, doesn't mean, you know, don't confuse tribulation that we have right now with the tribulation. Christians that live godly are going to suffer persecution. We, we know that from 2 Timothy 3.12. But we're not to confuse that with the idea that we're going to go through the wrath that is designed for the world as also for the Jewish people in the latter part of the tribulation. Now, one other passage that let me give you while we're talking about the church is not going through uh, the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 3, I don't have this in your notes here, but in Revelation chapter 3, and I believe it's verse number 10. He says, uh, this is talking to the church in Philadelphia. He says, which is the missionary minded church, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So we believe this is another reference to the fact that the church will not go through the tribulation. It's not that <clears throat> it's not like we don't deserve to go through it. It's just that God says you're not going to go through it, so why not just accept the fact for what Jesus says from the scripture. How do they teach around this the ones that don't believe? A lot of uh, allegorizing. Uh, you know, if you come at something with a preconceived idea, and of course the first allegorizer was the devil when he said, did God really say that and did he mean that? See? But it came, you know, came into almost full fruition in the time of, at the time of Constantine when he wedded the world with the church and then for, from about 15, uh, 500, 1500, the Roman church became predominant and they thought the kingdom of God was here on earth. And it wasn't. It was some of the most intense persecution of others other than anybody who were not papists. So um, so this passage talks, you know, the, the hope of our salvation. And a couple of others here, the, the hope of his calling. <clears throat> uh, well, let me, let me save this for, for next time because I want to... I want to talk a little bit more about the hope of our calling. I want to talk about calling, uh, you know, what that involves. There's a, uh, there's a general call and there's an effectual call. So let me save that for next week, uh, if I could. General and effectual? Mm -hmm. There's a general call or invitation to all mankind, and then, and then there's an effectual call <coughs> that goes out to those whom the Father has given to the Son, they will come. Uh, Philippians, we'll look at Philippians 2.13, where God energizes us both to be willing to be doing of his good pleasure. And then you also have in Philippians 1.29, it says, uh, it is given on your behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So I'll try to look at some of those passages, and I don't want to rush over so that. There is a difference between the two. Right, there's a difference between the general invitation. See, the general invitation would be something like John 3, 16, God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. And then John six thirty seven says, All whom the Father has given to me will come to me, but him who comes to me I won't cast out. So there's a general invitation that's given to all mankind, 
but only the specific ones who, and that deals with the subject of election, which a lot of people don't like. And I don't know how to fully you know, explain God's sovereignty and human responsibility and bring them together, but I'll try next week if we have a chance. All right, any other questions? Well, folks uh, who are on us with the internet, uh, thank you for being with us. We hope that uh, this was helpful to you. If you like it, push like. And if you would like to share it with somebody else, just push share over here. And uh, you never know. Uh, we hope that our message... Had, but the good news is, the Lord's coming back. The Lord who died for our sins was buried, rose again. Share that good news with people. That's how they get into the family of God. And once they get into the family of God, they have new enablements and abilities that unsafe people don't have. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for being with us on the internet. And folks who are here, thank you for coming.